So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bethany Gaunt and I'm Associate Director of the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Centre. The centre, as many of you will know, was created in memory of the late British historian Sir Martin Gilbert, who wrote very extensively on the history of the 20th century. He is celebrated as the official biographer of Sir Winston Churchill, but he did so much more besides. Indeed, Sir Martin published 88 books on a wide range of topics, including many works on the Holocaust. Sir Martin had a real skill at bringing history to a wide range of audiences and making it interesting and accessible. And our aim at the centre is to continue to do just this. As a charity, we rely on donations and any contributions would be gratefully received. It's easy to donate on our website and I'll pop a link in the chat when I finish speaking. Today, I'm really delighted to welcome Joe Heyman to speak about the future of Holocaust education. Joe is a charity leader and consultant. He is the former managing director of the Holocaust Educational Trust and former chief, chief executive of the PSHE Association. He is the author of two books on modern Britain, British Voices and British Journey, and he is now working to promote British values in schools and social change in the UK. Today, Joe is going to be reflecting on a personal level about how we are moving into uncharted territory in Holocaust education, as we envisage a future without survivors to guide us. Joe's going to talk for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll move on to a question and answer session. Please feel free, as usual, to message me with your questions, either in the chat or directly, and I'll put them to Joe after he finishes speaking. So without further ado, Joe, thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Bethany, and I'm delighted to be here and, and thank you to the Sir Martin Gilbert Centre for hosting me and to all of you for, for joining tonight. It's an honour to be here. Uh, I grew up surrounded by Sir Martin's books and it's been wonderful getting to know Esther in recent years. Esther, you're an amazing person, not just an authority on the Holocaust, but also on the best places in North London to find good chicken soup and meet new people. A sign that even from thousands of miles away, the spirit of the surrogate Jewish mother lives on. I met Esther when I was managing director of the Holocaust Educational Trust. And as Bethany said in her introduction, I'm here this evening to give my personal reflections on that experience and to talk about Holocaust education in its relevance and its relevance in modern Britain. I want to talk about resisting the urge to universalize the Holocaust, protecting the memory of those who are lost, and what happened from misappropriation, denial, distortion, drawing inspiration from those who survived and their families, and taking that inspiration into our contemporary world. And because this is a personal reflection, and because learning about the Holocaust is a matter of the heart and soul, as well as of the mind, at the end, I'm going to talk about a little about defiance and love. But before all of that, a little about me. I was born in January 1980, 35 years after the liberation of the Auschwitz concentration camp in January 1945. I'm of mixed heritage, my mother is Jewish, my father Christian, and my three brothers and I were educated just down the road from the St. Martin Gilbert Centre at William Miller School, a state comprehensive in the London Borough of Camden, educating students from all backgrounds and faiths. When the Holocaust Educational Trust was formed, one of its first achievements was to persuade the government that Holocaust education should become part of the national curriculum. That happened in 1991, the year I joined William Ellis. The school was a special place and will always be close to my heart. But if I'm honest, our lessons about the Holocaust when I was 13 or 14 weren't great. I remember students in the class laughing and joking as we were shown the television film Escape from Sobibor which dramatized the violent story of the camp's resistance, uprising and escape. In the middle of the lesson, one of my classmates stood up and gave a Nazi salute. I don't think it was in anger. I don't think he even knew what he was doing, but I'll never forget it. 25 years later, I found myself as managing director of the Holocaust Educational Trust as we worked to promote and improve Holocaust education across the UK. My, spirit, my experience at school shows why organizations like the Trust exist. Neither the teachers nor the students were bad. They just weren't equipped to deal appropriately with teaching and learning about the Holocaust, one of the most difficult subjects which schools will cover. 
through survivor testimony, lesson plans, teaching materials, training programs, events, site visits, and more. The trust in this partners work to ensure that students don't have the negative experience that I did. And that more than that, students go on to do great things, to take what they've learned out into the modern world. Through Heads Ambassador Programme, which supports young people through visits to Auschwitz and beyond, many remarkable things have been achieved by young people who will go far, in significant part as a result of that experience. I was glad to have the opportunity to play a tiny part during my time at the Trust in developing Holocaust education, particularly when the pandemic hit and forced us to take our work online. But I realise now that being part of that world changed me far more than I could ever change it. And I want to talk about that personal change because I think it may help in some small way to think about, think through the question of how we respond at this critical inflection point that, that Bethany mentioned as the Holocaust moves from living history and travel to Holocaust sites is severely disrupted. Holocaust education has to this point relied heavily on testimony, students visiting Holocaust sites, uh, sorry, relies heavily on experience, students visiting Holocaust sites and survivors sharing their testimony. But the pandemic has made international travel much harder and even more crucially for the purposes of what we're talking about today, survivors are getting older and frailer. And all of this is taking place against the backdrop of constant misappropriation, politicization, denial and distortion of the Holocaust. The question for me is not just how we respond to this moment, but to the Holocaust itself. Because once we have an answer to that question, we can tailor it to the world we currently face. I don't know, I don't even know if a tragedy of this size has a response, said Nobel laureate Ilya Wiesel in his foreword to his sem seminal book, Night. But what I do know is that there is a response in responsibility. When we speak of this e era of evil and darkness, so close but yet so distant, responsibility is the key word. So I want to take his lead and start with responsibility. The Holocaust is sacred and precious. In it are not just six million lives taken away, but also communities destroyed, stories and songs and memories lost forever, family chains broken, and a trauma for those who survived and their families, which lasts to this day. There are no adequate words to survive it, but there's something in the way the survivors speak of it, in their voices when they share their testimony, which gives just a glimpse of what it means to those of us who can never really understand. When they say the word Holocaust or Shoah, it is not like other words. It is imbued with special meaning. Words like music and art are mechanisms to express that, that which is in our hearts, a window to the soul. Special words to describe the Holocaust and its loss and trauma must be used carefully, humbly, responsibly. And yet that responsibility and humility about the Holocaust is not shared by all. In the modern world, in the rush for a like on social media or a laugh at a comedy night or win in an argument, the word and the experience and the trauma it represents are used irresponsibly so often that it is, that it is impossible to keep count. And that's not even the greatest fact threat that we face, in my view. That threat, rather, is the deliberate and concerted efforts we see to misappropriate, misappropriate, distort, or to deny the Holocaust in Europe, further afield, and here in the UK too. It is deeply dangerous, both in and of itself, but also in what it represents. As the American Holocaust historian Deborah Lipstadt, who took on Holocaust denier David Irving, said, these attacks on history and knowledge have the potential to alter dramatically the way established truth is transmitted from generation to generation. Ultimately, the climate they create is no less important, but is of no less importance than the specific truth they attack. No fact, no event, and no aspect of history has any fixed meaning or content. Any truth can be retold, any fact can be recast. There is no ultimate historical reality. It is, in other words, an assault on history, on memory, on truth, which not only creates the circumstances for great harm in the modern world, 
but which also compounds the trauma and hurt about the past. Ultimately, it deprives the dead of even being remembered. As political philosopher and Holocaust survivor Hannah Arendt said, the, the concentration camps, by making death itself anonymous, rob death of its meaning as the end of a fulfilled life. In a sense, they took away the individual's own death, own death, proving that henceforth nothing belonged to him and he belonged to no one. His death merely set a seal on the fact that he had never existed. The denial and distortion of the Holocaust continues that assault on the memory of those who died and undermines the trauma of those who survived. But it always has dangerous social and political intent too. Look at those who deny or distort the Holocaust in Hungary or Poland or closer to home. These people and movements need to be counted at every step. Both the deliberate and unthinking erosion of the Holocaust necessitate a robust response and lead me to my first point about the future of Holocaust education. That its primary task before we even think about a wider relevance in the modern world is to preserve and protect the history and memory of what happened, to defend the truth. The first part of the future, therefore, lies in the best possible history. And that's why I'm so glad to be talking at a center set up in the name of such an eminent historian. And I pay tribute to all the historians and educators I see in the audience tonight. The work of historians, educators, and curators to learn, to preserve, to share, is so vitally important in every area of history, but none more so in the, than in relation to the Holocaust, precisely because there are so many out there who would want to misuse or deny it. You all, you educators and historians have to show such skill, an incredible mix of passion for the subjects to engage learners with the dispassion that knows that any mistake or exaggeration would be exploited by those who want to abuse the Holocaust. Through your work, you ensure that what happened and the memory of those who were lost is preserved like a precious ornament in heirloom passed through generations. But while we may inst instinctively want to protect that precious memory gently inside carefully curated museums and in detailed, nuanced, assiduously researched books, the defense of the truth must go out into our public sphere because that's where the denial and the distortion and the misappropriation happen. And so Holocaust education must happen in the media, both traditional and social, in our politics, in our schools and colleges and university campuses and even in the courts as Deborah Lipstadt did when she took on David Irving. That task requires people with tenacity and courage and savvy, those who can make the complex simple for a wider audience and who can take on those, deny, those who deny and distort beyond the academic realm. I see that spirit in Karen Pollock, and all my former colleagues at the Holocaust Educational Trust, who work just not with schools and colleges and universities, but also with football clubs and drama producers and politicians and royalty to spread the truth in any accessible way. That doesn't mean endorsing works of fiction, which tell an engaging story, but disengage from the truth. It, might, it means finding a sweet spot, which includes both truth and accessibility which ensures that the story of the Holocaust has its greatest possible reach. It's hard work and the talent and professionalism of that team and the educators who work with them, many of them here tonight, is incredible. But it's a broad coalition which extends beyond the professionals. When David Baddiel appeared on Good Morning Britain last week to debunk uh, Whoopi Goldberg's assertion that the Holocaust wasn't about race, he had a matter of seconds to teach millions why that assertion was wrong and damaging, and he delivered brilliantly. While some may say that this isn't proper history, public education delivered excessively by non-experts can and must be a part of the future of Holocaust education if we're to defend the truth in a modern world where sound bites matter and the battle for truth extends well beyond academic circles. It's no use knowing the truth 
as Holocaust survivor Lily Ebert says in her book, Lily's Promise, if people don't listen. And for me, that compels Holocaust education to be taken to, pe to, taken to people where they are and with a message which is accessible as well as informative. And while I'm talking about Lily, I want to talk about those who played the most important role in the coalition, in this coalition defending the truth, those who lived through the Holocaust. Meeting and working with Holocaust survivors has been one of the great honors of my life. They're so remarkable. And while of course you try to stay professional around them, you know you're in the company of the very best of humanity. Their strength not just to go on, but to turn their trauma and loss to good is humbling. In my head, I'll always be able to hear Lily at our annual dinner in 2019. She said, I promised myself if I survived, I would share my story for those who could not. The sheer strength, the defiance in her voice, it has such power and that voice needs to be preserved at all costs. So at the risk of stating the obvious, the most urgent task as we look to the future is in my view to gather and curate all the testimony we possibly can in every language and format and with a view to formats which aren't even mainstream yet. It is worth acknowledging that for all the awfulness of the pandemic, it has forced innovation and that must continue even as things return to some form of normality. Our, innov in our innovative approach to technology should extend to place as well as people. Hence lessons from Auschwitz online platform, for example, uses virtual reality to enable young people to experience that memorial museum, even if they aren't able to travel there. I've already invited myself to the first Lessons from Auschwitz visit to Poland post-pandemic, whenever that is. But while we hope to return to normality in our lives very soon, the technological revolution in Holocaust education must continue regardless. Because testimony and technology, that's what it's about now. You have such a small window to capture testimony, but once it's gone, it's gone forever. As I think about that in my head, I hear Freddie Noller, who died at age 100 last month, who said on one of the Trust Appeal films that I helped edit, our greatest fear is that the world will forget. We can all help to carry, carry the mantle. And I'll speak more about that in a moment. In a moment. But as Elie Wiesel said, no one can speak for the dead. We need their words and their stories in the most accessible format possible so that we can continue to share them. And speaking of the mantle, I think we should reflect on the role of second and third and fourth generations as the links in the chain, not just of family, but of memory and spirit too. In her book, Lily's Promise, co-written with her great-grandson, Dolph Mormon, Lily Ebert says this. Long ago, on Yom Kippur 1944, I made a promise to myself. If I survived against all the odds, and I never believed I would, but if I survived, I'd tell the world what really happened. To be certain that Dov will take over my story, even when I'm gone, gives me peace of mind. I've kept that promise I made to myself in the camp. I've told the world what happened. And the extra special thing is that I have help. Dolph will keep telling the world. He will keep my promise too. I find that last line of Lily's, the comfort of not having to carry the responsibility of sharing the story on our own, so moving. For almost eight decades, the survivors have not only borne their own trauma, but also the responsibility for sharing their story. I'm glad to see survivors like Lily starting to share the load. No one can speak for her or for any of the survivors, but others can provide a platform to share a story, to, to contextualize, to show photos and introduce films, and to give their own experience of being in the presence of a remarkable person and how that has changed them. Holocaust education must always be human, I think more than just words and numbers. Beyond their families, many who have heard from survivors want to be links in the chain too. 
And if Isel said that to hear from a witness is to become a witness, they are a crucial part of the future. The young people like the HES ambassadors, Holocaust Educational Trust ambassadors will bring the energy and strength of youth to reach a new generation with the truth of the past. In my experience, they do so with huge moral courage and without fear. They take on and carry not just the truth of the Holocaust, but the spirit of the survivors. There was always a magic when ambassadors and survivors were together when I was at the Holocaust Educational Trust. And it is a source of great sadness that the last two years have prevented those two groups coming together more often. But as we think about young people taking on the mantle into the modern world, I think we need to think really carefully about what that means and whether there is a wider purpose beyond the defense of the truth and the memorialization and remembrance of those who are no longer with us. I speak of that challenging area of Holocaust education, the notion of contemporary relevance. It's challenging because in teaching about the Holocaust, we stress its singularity. The Shoah is an unparalleled act of evil. And in defending the Holocaust from those who would deny or distort or misappropriate it, we are careful to stress that it is unique and that comparison is offensive. How should we then carry the Holocaust into the contemporary world? Or should we do so at all? I don't think that's a question for me to answer alone. It wasn't my experience, and I'm not sure it falls to me to imbue the events of others' history with my own meaning. Instead, I look to survivors for guidance on a question which is as much of the soul as it is of the mind. We must take sides, said Elie Wiesel, as he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. When human beings are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Whenever men and women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. Lily Ebert, you're hearing a lot from her tonight. Um, I loved, loved working with, it, with Lily. She had a similar sentiment in, in her book. She said, I once hoped naively that after the Holocaust, genocides could never happen again. I was wrong. But that only makes my task more urgent. The way we can learn from what happened is by speaking about it. It's so important to tell the world what can happen when we're not tolerant of each other. This is the main thing to understand. It makes no difference what the color of your skin is or what nationality you are, because for all the human beings, one thing is for sure. Our blood is red and when you cut it, it hurts. That is what I want children to remember when they hear my story. If we don't keep remembering, we can't change the future. If we follow this instruction, and it would take a far braver person than me to contradict Lily Eber. Then our question becomes how to take the Holocaust into the modern world, to protect it, to avoid the misappropriation we find so offensive amongst others, creeping into our own work, to talk about it in a modern context without undermining its singularity or the very specific Jewish experience. On this question, I draw upon a piece which Karen Pollock wrote for the Jewish Chronicle around Holocaust Memorial Day 2021. In a piece entitled, Time to Stop Making Lazy Holocaust Comparisons, she said this, and I hope you'll forgive me quoting at length, but I think it's really important. Karen said this, all too often we see parallels drawn to the Holocaust in inappropriate contexts. One can understand why people do this. They see the Holocaust as a defining example of something horrifying, the ultimate symbol of evil, as Professor Yehuda Pahala put it. But the intent does not make the comparison any less dangerous. Attempts to draw these parallels do a disservice to both the Holocaust and to current events. We use a unique word, the Holocaust, in Hebrew, the Shoah, for a reason. 
to try to describe a unique experience, to seek as best we can to put the unspeakable into words. In protecting the Holocaust from misappropriation, so we protect and honor the experience. We want young people to learn from the past and to take action against hatred in the modern world. In doing so, we know that, we, that while we learn from the past, we cannot transpose events that happened a lifetime ago onto our world today. While we want every young person to know about the Holocaust, it is important that they do not see every other event simply through that prism. In every act of evil, victims have their own identity, their own history, and their own stories. These stories deserve to be told in their own right, on their own terms, and in their own words, not through the prism of others' experience or using others' terms. And then she concludes, we must learn the lessons of history without making inappropriate comparisons. We must know what happens when anti-Semitism and hatred are allowed to go unchecked. While we cannot use history to draw a direct roadmap for the future, we must watch out for the warning signs, the chilling echoes of the past, which serve as alarm bells for our collective conscience. When we do, we must never stand by, because what we have learned about the Holocaust compels us to stand up. We owe it to the victims and the survivors to do so while ensuring that the memory of the Holocaust is forever preserved and is never, ever devalued. In her piece, Karen is able to thread the needle of taking inspiration and learning from the Holocaust without seeing every subsequent event through its lens. To give a practical example, it has been telling how the Jewish community has been so vocal about the plight of the Uyghur minority in Xinjiang, China. One particular spurt of action was the sight of shackled and blindfolded Uyghur men, their heads shaved, being loaded onto trains bound for so-called re-education camps. It was a sight which, to use Karen's words, served as an alarm bell for our collective conscience, or to put it more crudely, made hair stand up on end and made us feel sick in the pit of our stomachs. The fact that what is happening in Xixiang, Xinjiang elicits that visceral reaction amongst those of us who worked in Holocaust education does not mean that what is happening to the Uyghurs is the same as what happened in the Holocaust, or that Jews or anyone else should speak for the Uyghurs. The Uyghur story must be told themselves by people like the amazing Rahima Mahmoud, the UK representative of the World Uyghur Congress, who you should all see speak if you haven't already. And Bethany, I'll send you a, a link to, uh, to some of uh, Rahima's speeches, which are amazing. Our moral imperative is to be the allies to people like Rahima and to give them our platforms and support. It means to draw upon Elie Fizel again, that we should do, do all we can to make Xinjiang become at this moment, the center of the universe. In that respect, I think it's worth paying tribute to the group of Holocaust Educational and Trust Ambassadors who have formed a new group called Yes Again, aimed at raising awareness of modern atrocity. Inspired by the experience of visiting Auschwitz and hearing from survivors, they have gone on to fight for human rights all around the world. This isn't because those events around the world are the same as what happened in the Holocaust. It's because, as Karen Pollock said, we have we have learned about what we have learned about the Holocaust compels us to stand up and never stand by and to fight the conviction that, as Primo Levi put it, every stranger is an enemy. When we look to the future of Holocaust education, therefore, we must consider how separately from defending the truth memorializing those who are killed and honoring the Jewish experience. We can support those who have been inspired by the Holocaust, by their Holocaust education, to work to counter not just contemporary anti-Semitism, but also wider intolerance or atrocity or genocide in the world today. That may involve further effort to teach about allyship and defining events, both modern and historical, 
in their own terms rather than, than in comparison to one another. And in order to protect, protect the uniqueness of the Holocaust, it might be worth considering whether the, this work on contemporary issues should happen under other banners than Holocaust education. But irrespective of the name or the brand, that work for me is part of fulfilling the survivor's promise and is part of our collective responsibility. So too, in my view, is learning about and from the rise of Nazism. Here, I think lessons can be drawn about on the impact of othering, of dehumanization, about the dangers of politics, about, about the dangers of politics of identity and nationalism, about bystanding and unthinking acceptance of instruction from authority and the human blind spot when danger is just over the hill. All of this can be learned about and drawn from without erasing or damaging the memory of the Holocaust, which, as I've said, needs to be carefully preserved. And it's on those issues that I now work. And if I'm invited back to the centre after my lecture today, perhaps I'll expand upon them then. Suffice it to say that my new project, Rebuild Britain, takes inspiration from the late Rabbi Lord Sachs's book, The Home We Build Together, which deals with the hard work of building a cohesive, diverse society. It is difficult work because the work of engaging with those you disagree with, finding common ground of persuasion, of taking on challenging issues, is a lot harder than the moral superiority we sometimes see in our public debate. But in approaching it, I carry with me the spirit of the survivors who never lecture or consider themselves better than those they're speaking to, who never say things just for applause or for the likes, who approach their work with humility and kindness, but with serious intent. If they can do it, I really have no excuses. Other former head staff who I worked with over the last three years now work in both Jewish and mainstream secondary and tertiary education and on wider issues relating to sustainability and the environment. But we will all be lifelong members of the coalition to defend the truth. And what's more, I think we will all carry a spirit and we are all changed by our experience, by visiting the places, by learning what happened, and most of all, meeting the survivors. And it's their spirit, the survivor spirit, which I want to close on. When we think about the Holocaust, many of us will think first of the six million Jews and their lives lost in this ultimate act of wickedness. We must always remember them. To forget them, as Elie Wiesel said, would be akin to killing them again. But he also said that Holocaust was a war not just against Jewish men, women, and children, but also against Jewish religion, Jewish culture, Jewish tradition, and therefore Jewish memory. And here I want to turn to the, the PowerPoint um, and quote from Primo Levi. So if you just hold on for one, one second, this is the only bit of the presentation I've been uh, nervous about is getting the PowerPoint right. Just going to share my screen. Everyone see that? Yeah. Okay. So Premier Levy said this. Our language likes words to express this offence, the demolition of a man. They've taken away our clothes, our shoes, even our hair. They will, take, they will take away even our name. And if we want to keep it, we will have to find in ourselves the strength to do so. Because the aim was to reduce us to beasts, we must not become beasts. We must force ourselves to save at least the skeleton, the scaffolding, the form of civilization. We are slaves deprived of every right, exposed to every insult, condemned to certain death, but we still possess one last power and we must defend it with all of our strength, for it is the last, the power to refuse our consent. So we must wash our faces and dry ourselves on our jackets. We must polish our shoes, not because regulation states it, but for dignity and propriety. We must walk erect, not in homage to the Prussian discipline, but to remain alive not to begin to die. 
Imagine now a man who is deprived of everything he loves, and at the same time of his house, his habits, his clothes, in short, everything he possesses. He will be a hollow man, reduced to suffering and needs, forgetful of dignity and restraint. If he loses all often, who loses all often easily, loses himself. He will be a man whose life or death can lightly be decided with no sense of human affinity in the most fortunate of cases on the basis of a pure judgment of utility. It is in this way that we can understand the double sense of the term extermination camp. I just want to hold that for a second. All of that deprivation of not just of life, but of, of humanity. And then I want to move on and talk about the survivors who I work with, or I had the privilege of working with at the Holocaust Educational Trust, and show you some photos from just last month of survivors having their portraits unveiled um, by the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall. Many of you will know Siggy Schipper um, and Manfred Goldberg. And there they are together. And this is Lily Ebert, who I quoted earlier on in front of her portrait. And there's the portrait. These aren't people who just survived. These are people who lived. In his book, Premier Levy talks about not just a physical survival, but moral survival too. And I see that moral survival in the survivors who I've been so lucky to know. The compulsion in them not just to tell their story, but to be kind, to defy the Nazis and their collaborators through keeping Jewish history and culture alive. Not just through art and music, but also through family and love. Thornton Wilder said, that there is a world of the living and the world of the dead and the bridge is love. In the face of the worst atrocity, the survivors keep that bridge strong. In her book, Lily recounts what she said when she returned to Auschwitz with her granddaughter. Look at me, she said, I'm back. You wanted to kill me and yet here I am again. You murderers aren't here anymore, but I am. And this time with my daughter's daughters. You wanted to destroy us, you can't. You didn't win, you will never win. Not as long as we were here. Not as long as we are here and we remember. That defiance is something which will always stick with me, which has changed me. And I will always think this, that defiance is about moral survival as well as physical. And it's about celebrating and enjoying and cherishing life songs and art and drama and birthdays and weddings and more. And remembering that whatever else people may try to strip from you, however hard they try, you still have love. It is a personal reflection, of course, but the power of Holocaust education is that it isn't solely academic. It is development of the soul and of the mind. So what is the future of Holocaust education? Well, for me, it's assiduous historians working intently in pursuit of the truth and its preservation. It's true to brave leaders, taking it beyond schools and universities and working with public figures in support of broader accessible public education on social media and TV and radio and politics and beyond. It's the testimony of survivors captured in the most wide ranging and accessible formats possible. New technology bringing truth to people, not waiting for them to come to truth. And alumni of young and old defending the truth and standing up against atrocity, injustice and intolerance wherever they find it. Learning along the way what allyship looks like and how to take inspiration for the Holocaust from the Holocaust while avoiding universalizing it. And in all of that broad coalition of Jews and non-Jews, a common spirit, not just in our professional lives, but in our personal lives too, to never stand by, to defy those who would do harm, to live life fully, 
to love. And it is with love to all of you that I'll end there and take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Joe. That was really, really brilliant. And I think starting as you did with your experience at school, which I, I mean, I, I think I looked visibly shocked hearing about your uh, classmate who, who did a Nazi salute in the middle of um, learning about the Holocaust, to then hear about the Holocaust Educational Trust ambassadors who are taking on the mantle and even forming splinter groups. That was really moving and 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 gives me some optimism as we go forward and and i'm very grateful that you've spoken to us tonight because you have been right at the heart of holocaust education in the uk and you've obviously had the honor of working with and hearing from so many survivors so thank you again for sharing that it was brilliant um i have my own question for you and i've received some in the chat but i see that taffy has had patiently had her hand up oh taffy you've had your hand up so I would invite you to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. Thanks very much. And thank you for a most thoughtful and thought provoking presentation. In the early 1990s, Steven Spielberg uh, embarked upon a project called Survivors of the Shoah, which were to consist of visual histories that would be featured in centers around the world. Did anything ever come of that? And if so, has it been effective? Um, yeah, I mean, the the USC um, Shoah Foundation, uh, which Steven Spielberg uh, sets up, uh, has a massive repository of uh, Holocaust survivor testimony, and uh, they are increasingly working with um, uh, interactive techno uh, technology as well, so giving the opportunity for um, people to engage with survivors, so to ask questions and to um, to be able to get a response. And that work is also being replicated uh, here in the UK by um, the National Holocaust Centre and, and Museum, which again uh, has recorded these amazing testimonies of survivors where they share their story uh, and then are recorded for days on end. Um, answering every possible question that you can imagine so that you're presented with a, a screen you know, a screen a little bit like you're all seeing me and able to ask any question and um the the smart computer is able to to sort of come up with the with the correct response and i think that that's a really important part of the future um it's an amazing technology and it, it keeps that engagement and i think we've We've been so lucky in Holocaust education because the history is is so re is so recent. You know, um, I said at the start, I was I was born only thirty five years after the uh, after the liberation of Auschwitz. You know, this is within living history, and we've got used to be able, being able to engage with the survivors. Um, and that engagement, I think, you know, there's nothing like having someone there right in front of you. But that kind of technology that the Shoah Foundation and others are, are sort of leading the way on is is the next best thing. So when I talk about technological revolution, that's that's what I'm talking about. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you for the answer. I'm going to hop in with mine and then I've, I'm going to return to the ones in the chat if that's OK. I'm using my privileged position to do that. Um, I wondered if you could, you tantalisingly touched on it. If you could tell us a little bit about your future plans and if there is anything you'll be directly taking from your time at the Holocaust Educational Trust into your future work. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, just to say that I, I, I wanted to try to sort of to separate that out in some degree, because I think, as I was trying to say in the, in the sort of presentation, I, I think you have to be really, really careful about appropriating the Holocaust for any other um, intention beyond memorialization uh, and remembrance. Um, uh, and even those who do it with good intent um, have to be really, really careful. So I think my, my, my sort of future work will be about national identity and cohesion here in the UK. Um, I think it's really important that um, we work really hard to try and build a successful multicultural society. I don't think we can just assume that that's going to happen. I think experience across the world suggests that um, 
it's difficult. It's really hard work to build an equal society of people of all faiths, none with people from all over the world. It is, it is a challenge and you can't just assume that it will, it will happen naturally. Um, and what I want to do is to, to work in schools and other places to try to, um, uh, to try to ensure that integration. And when I talk about integration, I don't talk, I don't just mean people coming from overseas integrating into the British way, but a two-way integration, the building together of a more cohesive society. So I want to do work with schools. I want to do work with new migrants. Um, I'd like to have a kind of Holocaust educational trust equivalent but focused on education about British values, citizenship, um, history, all of these kind of contested and challenging areas. Um, and I think that is the essential work of ensuring that we do have a, a successful multicultural society. I really want to work with, with new migrants to the UK. I think English language lessons are crucial. I don't think people can participate in society or avail themselves of the, uh, the opportunities to which they're entitled as British citizens if they're not able to speak the language. Um, but equally, I think we need to help people learn about citizenship as well, what it means to be British. You know, there's a life in the UK test. I don't know whether anyone who's on the on the call tonight has, has actually done that test or been through it, but um, it asks you questions like about the height of Tower Bridge in, in London, the answer to which I have absolutely no idea. I've written two books about Britain. I was born in Britain. I am British, I have no idea, and probably wouldn't pass that test. Um, so how do we not just teach for that test, but prepare um, people who come to this country to, to understand what this country is really about, really about, about the rights and responsibilities of living here. Um, that's what I'm sort of passionate about doing and doing the same for, for young people in schools and that public education as well. You know, talks about David Baddiel, Good Morning Britain, for, those joining from overseas that's that's a popular um sort of morning tv program um but everywhere you go you want to sort of get your message out there and that means going outside the sort of traditional means and you know that's the that's the kind of spirit we've had at the holocaust educational trust and um the sort of spirit that i want to take into this new project as well that sounds really interesting and i am sure we would like to have you back at some point to talk more about that 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 really does sound great. Um, so now it's only fair that I take a question from the floor. So Eugene's asked a couple of questions. I'll, I'll ask the first now and we'll get to the second one in a bit, hopefully. So Eugene says, the Holocaust was described by Joe as sacred. In what sense is this used? Exclusive, venerable, due respect, or was there another meaning? It's a bit of a tricky one. <laughs> Uh, what were the options? Exclusive, memorable? Uh, venerable. Exclusive, venerable. Due respect or another meaning? Um, oh, basically, what did you mean by sacred? What did I mean by sacred? Um, I don't, I'm not sure I'm, I'm going to be able to add any more than I said before. It, you're talking about six million lives lost, communities destroyed, um that sort of that loss of life and loss of memory that loss of connection by like the way the way that this happened this collective trauma which now permeates to second and third and fourth generations um you know in my mind it's the worst thing that's ever happened um and when i see people using the Holocaust for a, for a cheap laugh or to make a cheap point. Um, I find that upsetting. I see that as the opposite of taking the care and consideration that this, this event, this ultimate act of wickedness, as I think I said in the presentation, um, deserves. Um, for me, that is, that's what I mean by being sacred. It means being incredibly careful about the way that you you use it um, and that's not to say that we that we shouldn't talk about the holocaust in in other contexts that we shouldn't take inspiration from the survivors and the way that they've stood up you know i quoted i quoted lily who said 
who talks about other genocides uh, that are happening in the world, other atrocities. She's a survivor. She she was at Auschwitz. She knows better than me how to sort of to sort of take this experience into the modern world. All I would say is that I think it has to be done with the most extreme care, um, and that care is what I mean when I talk about being sacred. Yeah, brilliant. Um, sort of relatedly, uh, Roger asks. How is it possible to deny or misappropriate the Holocaust? Now, I don't know if that's just an expression of disbelief, but I think you touched upon where well, you definitely dealt in my mind up on the um, on how the Holocaust has been misappropriated. Um, I wondered maybe you could speak about if you've if in your capacity as um, working at HET, if there were recent trends of denial denial is that something we want to give a lot of uh, air time to I mean is there anything you'd like to say about that well I mean I talked about Deborah Deborah lived that and um you know taking on taking on denial I mean I don't think it takes it takes much searching on the internet to find some pretty abhorrent um abhorrent stuff um I think if you look at political debate and political parties in Eastern Europe, Hungary, Poland, elsewhere. I think there are sort of political movements on which I'm not expert. And I wanted to stress at the start that there's more a kind of personal reflection than anything else. But it seemed to me, at, at the very least, trying to politicize the Holocaust for, um, for sort of political purposes, if you like. Um, and that would seek to deny or distort what happened and who was responsible and why. Um, I think those are those are issues that you know IRA, the International Alliance, um, deals with, and others that occasionally the Holocaust Education Trust will will have a view on. Um, but I don't think it would it would take long. And if it you know if it's helpful, I can send a few links around to more sort of authoritative um, studies on on Poland and Hungary, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that's thank you. Um, uh, so we've got quite a few now. Um, an interesting, possibly controversial one. Do people ask you about the use or abuse of Holocaust memory in Israel? I don't know if that was something you came across at uh, No, I mean, I, I mean, that's that's. That's never come. That's never come across um, my my radar, um, and I'd be interested to to understand more about what underpins that that question, um, and if whoever's asked it would like to either stay on after or or have an exchange after. I'd I'd, I'd be fascinated to to have that conversation. But no, that's not something I've ever I've ever come across myself. Hopefully everybody's seen, and I'll try and remember to post again, but um, Joe very kindly has shared his email address so you can uh, reach out if you've got any burning questions that we don't get around to today. Uh, we've got a, a question which I think is inspired by um, my question, I'll say, modestly, um, hopefully. In your, in your opinion, how does one break the ancient reflexive slash traditional hatred and oppression of the other in every country of every continent? So a question about your future work there, I think, and, and also your work in HET, maybe. That's Very quite, big question. That's quite a hard question. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, and, uh, and I, I, don't know, I don't know the answer to it, and I'm not sure that anyone, anyone knows the answer to it. I mean, I think just a couple of, there's a lot of reflections. One is about coalitions. Um, and we are a coalition of people here today, different backgrounds. So I talked about the coalition of young and old and survivors and ambassadors and others who have sort of taken on um, taken on the challenge around Holocaust denial and distortion and misappropriation. Um, a couple of just one reflection, which is that some sometimes there's a question asked, or I've heard the question asked, you know, has, has Holocaust education failed? Because we still see anti-Semitism in in the UK, or we see Holocaust now, or people aren't as uh, people are perhaps somewhat ignorant about uh, about the Holocaust. Um, I don't think that's true. I think every generation faces its challenge challenges around this. I think we're talking about the human condition, um, and part of the human condition is the 
the amazing love and spirit that I talked about from Liddy and Ziggy and Manfred and all the other survivors who I've been lucky enough to know. And part of that human spirit is the fear of the other and um, the fear of the unknown, the tendency to, to sort of gather in groups, the uh, the sort of um, the sort of willingness to bow down to authority, even if that authority is is damaging. Um, and that's a challenge for every every generation, every country, every every place. I can only really talk about here in the UK because that's that's where I know where I know the best. But I think I think the answer is not moral superiority. As I said in the presentation, I don't think the answer is to say, well, look, I'm better than I'm better than you because I didn't vote for this party or that party or I voted this way in the referendum or that way. It's to start from a position that we're all equal um, and that a lot of terrible things that happen are born out of fear and ignorance as much as badness. I don't believe that people are, are born bad. Um, and I think that there are opportunities along the way to influence the way that people's lives turn out. I don't think it, it is destiny. Um, so what, what do I think in terms of Britain? I think education is really, really important. I think it's really important that in schools, young people learn not just about English and maths and science and all those really important things, but also learn how to be a good citizen um, in the modern world. Um, I think it's really important that young people have experiences where they mix with others from different backgrounds. You know, when I was, when I was writing my book, it was, um, or what, uh, both of my books, I sort of go around and, and talk to people and sometimes you'd hear um, sort of prejudiced attitudes about different groups. Um, but those attitudes never extended to people that the, that the people I was talking to knew. So they might say, uh, you know, he's all right, it's just this group or that group or whatever else, but my neighbor's fine. And I think those opportunities to share um, to do things together, to share activities, to play sport, to do art, to, work, to do whatever else. I think it's really, really important. And that's why, you know, people might wince when I tell the story about the, the Nazi salute at, at William Ellis. Um, but I had a good education there. We had people from all around the world, um, you know, scores of different home languages taught at that school. Um, and that was an amazing exposure for a, you know, middle class white kid like me. Um, and I, I take that even with the with the difficult things that, that came with it. I think that exposure is incredibly important. So, I'll always start with education. I also think if education of young people is one entry point into into society, then I think another entry point in, into society is those who who enter our society as, as, as adults, migrants, refugees, asylum seekers. I do think that language can be a barrier. Um, I think words are the way, as I said in the presentation, words are the way that we explain what's in our heart. And if we don't have words, if we can't communicate with one another, then there is that fear that the person who's different becomes the enemy. So I think teaching people how to speak the language that is used in in society is really really important um and i think it's really important that people understand the mores of this, of society as well um and i just want to finish that answer on the notion of building you know rabbi lord Sachs talks about the home we build together uh and that notion of shared activity of activities that people take together not just breaking bread but actually doing things together undertaking projects or cycle rides or um, community initiatives or whatever else. I think opportunities for people to actually do things to get to see one another as human beings, I think are hugely, hugely important. And it's all little by little, brick by brick. Um, you build a stronger society. By the way, um, I think huge progress has been made as well, even since I was, I was at school. Uh, I think that the generation of young ambassadors who we work with the Holocaust Educational Trust are far more engaged on these issues, far more sort of forgiving and understanding racism and homophobia are far um, more sort of challenged and frowned upon than they were 
when I was at school. Um, so I think change can happen, but every generation faces its own its own fight, and I'm I'm sort of geared up for ours. Thank you. That's really inspiring to hear, and I'm personally very excited to see what you move on to and how how you combat um, combat these issues in future. And, and it is encouraging. I agree wholeheartedly with you wholeheartedly with you that many many issues grow out of a fear of the unknown and and just not having that education so I think education is always going to be an answer um I think that seems like a poignant point to end on if you agree is if there's, if there's anything else you'd like to say then please do go ahead but no no I, I <laughs> just just that it was an absolute um honor to to speak to you all of you if anyone wants to keep in touch uh, afterwards, uh, Bethany sent my uh, email address around. If it's all right, Bethany, I'll I'll send a couple of links um, tomorrow. I think particularly to to Rahima and the World o uh, the World Uyghur Congress. Um, you know, I, I I can't speak more passionately about about them. And while you know my focus is is Britain right now, terrible things are happening in in China, and I think we should all be aware. Um, and support and that solidarity I know means so much to her and to them um, so anyone who wants to sort of join their mailing list or get involved in their campaign um, obviously very different from from my focus in in Britain but but just so so important so uh, if it's all right I'll I'll be in touch and communicate after the event Absolutely, and I'll gladly circulate that information. I will send everybody a, a link to the recording as well and a survey. Be really grateful if you could fill that out. Um, our next event uh, later this month is on Churchill and the Royals. So you can head over to our website to book your free ticket for that. Um, but no, thank you. Thank you so much, Joe, for a brilliant talk and thank you all for joining us. So goodbye and good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.